welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Well, Jim, we are so excited to dive in with you because not only have you done a lot for yourself in terms of investing in real estate, but you've created an entire community for others to learn and build wealth for themselves as well, something that we're very passionate about. So we're excited to talk about that. But first... I want to laser zoom in on a, the moment, that moment that shifted everything for you. And I know, you know, there was a time in your life you were teaching and you were, um, you were kind of working as a financial advisor on the site. As a financial advisor, they were teaching me about money and, and the products that we were selling. And that's where it kind of, I realized that I was kind of tending more and more towards real estate. In fact, when um, when we tried when the markets improved, we and again accidental landlord. We tried to sell that house because I still, like I said, I didn't like being a landlord. I saw the money coming in, but I didn't really realize what it was doing um, because it comes in in small amounts. You know, a few hundred dollars a month, and you're like, that's not very much money. And so I went to a realtor and I said, Hey, I want to sell this house, and he said, But but it's paid off, and you have a tenant in it. How about this? How about you get a mortgage on the house because the equity in your home earns nothing, right? 0% return on that equity. So why don't you buy two more? I'll sell you two more. I'll manage them for you. You'll have three. And so what I did was I turned one cash flowing asset that wasn't earning anything on the equity into three cash flowing assets by financing the property. And then that's just when all the bells and whistles, you know, just like everything kind of hit. I'm like, oh, this is great. So so here, I want to pull this out for the listener yeah. because first is, you know, just to go from zero to one, I think that's probably the hardest thing is to not have any real estate and then to go to that first property. So for you, that was kind of an accidental landlord situation, but you had that one, you turned the one into three and then you said, wait a second, but one is good three is better, four is even better. And so you jumped in and went all the way to 22, then eight additional on top of that. It sounds like you quickly amassed 30, 40 units. And so then I want to hear, was it as easy and as good as you thought it was going to be, or were there hiccups along the way? Oh, there was nothing but hiccups. It was, it was, (laughs) it was not good at all because I'm a Excel guy. I'm a finance guy. I had it all planned out I knew that 22 units, I knew how much money it was going to make. I talked to the property manager and, and found out how much it would cost to turn a, a, a unit. And I mean, I did all the research I thought, and then I got in it. And really what it ended up being is me arguing constantly with the property manager for not <laughs> evicting people because I didn't oh, realize at the no. time I was still early on, right? I didn't realize that, you know, if I have to spend five or six grand on turning a unit, I didn't realize that that the new rents that I would get would change the value of the property. I was just looking mm. at cash flow. Nothing ever cash flowed. We had all kinds of problems with tenants. It was, I mean, it was just, it was, it was a C-class property. Um, it never, ever cash flowed. And it was just frustrating from the moment. And, and the eight unit was around the corner and the four unit was somewhere else close by. And it was all just, um, it was just a struggle for the two or three years that I owned those properties but I was rescued by the market. I was a terrible asset manager, right? Which, which when I got into syndication yeah. investing, that's where I realized, oh, I'm going to hire an asset manager. That asset manager, that is their full time job. That's what they do for a living. And they deal with property managers because as I was doing all these multifamilies, I was also doing um, single family turnkeys in Memphis and Indianapolis on the side. So I w- and I was constantly struggling with um, property managers. So none of my, um, properties cash flowed almost at all, except for those original three. And eventually I got around to selling them and fortunately made a lot of money, right? Because anyone can make money in those days. The market saved me, but they never cash flowed and they, they just didn't work out for me. But you know, the 22 unit, for example, I sold it to a, a, a friend of mine um, who had a business of renovating apartments and doing all that stuff, knowing like I had doubled the value in a couple of years just by sitting there and not knowing what I was doing. And I knew he would double it again in a year if I sold it to him. And so I was fine to do that because I made my money and I did not have the capacity to evict everybody, redo all the units and keep going. I was just exhausted. So I sold it to him knowing that he would make a killing on it. And he did. Uh, But that was the best move for me. And and that's part of the reason I I like real estate, right? It was 
that's truly a win-win. I, and I don't feel like I missed out on anything because I couldn't go through the work and all of the stuff it would take to, to do what he was doing because he did it for a living. He was better at it than I was. So you got to recognize your strengths. What do you like to talk to people about now with being able to make the jump into syndications? Yeah. You, you really have to recognize where your strengths are, right? If, if you are great at swinging a hammer, then maybe active real estate is for you. Or if you know a certain market in Columbus, Ohio, and you know that better than anyone else, then perhaps you have an advantage. But if you don't have any of those skills, which I didn't, then you have to go with your strength. And my strength, I think, is evaluating properties, vetting operators, and understanding how to select asset managers. So if someone is, they have different strengths that, that maybe go more towards active, I would say, yeah, try out, try out active. But if you're a professional, um, you know, who has a, has a job or has kids or has all these other things and you don't have the skills or the time or the desire to do active real estate, then syndication investing is for you, definitely. And I think most of people end up in the place where syndication investing could be for you. The, the challenge is not really transitioning from active real estate to passive real estate for most people. It's 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 switching from Wall Street, what at left field investors we call the right field, right? People that are in paper assets into real assets to produce cash flow. And that's our passion. I know that's, that's your passion as well. But at left field investors, we want to just show people, hey, you can do this. You can do real estate. And um, you know, we, we call it community personal finance, right? There, there's there's three kinds of finance in, in our worlds. One is kind of the Wall Street stuff. It's easy. Everyone does it. It's not scary. You know, you just put money in your 401k and, and off you go. Um, but the problem with that is it's highly taxed and the returns aren't as good as real estate, right? Real estate is alternative investing. And that's scary. And that's hard. As you know, many of the investments are hidden. You, you have to send wire transfers, which are scary. Um, it, there's just a lot there that you don't understand. And so community personal finance is kind of the third part that, that what Leftfield Investors talks about is you take a community and then you invest in alternatives. So now we're working together to vet operators, to analyze deals. And you have people you can talk to about this. Because if you walk out your front door right now and talk to your neighbors about um, finance, they're going to talk 401k, IRA, interest rate on the mortgage, right? And then you're going to say, well, what about the real estate syndications that I just invested in a 200-unit apartment complex? And then you're going to turn around and everyone's gone because you're the weirdo talking about syndications. So that's kind of how you know I look at it is that's why you need a community. If you want to be an effective real estate investor in passive syndications, you need a community, left field investors or good egg or whoever, and maybe both or all. So you have other people you can talk to, share information with. And that's really the core of real estate investing for me now. Now, as the, the financial landscape is shifting a bit, the conversations may change. So I'm curious, what are some of the top things that maybe people are, are talking about or bringing to the community? Maybe some things that people are struggling with, or even education-wise, what are some of the hurdles that... Um, that you see people struggling with? I, I think right now it's dealing with capital calls and paused distributions because they're two separate things. And I think mean, initially people get really upset or did when they first started, people started pausing distributions, right? And, um, you know, I've talked to Brian Burke, who's, a, who's an operator. He's a very knowledgeable guy, wrote a great book. And what he has al always said is distributions are, you're just distributing cash flow from the operations, right? It's profit. So it's not going to be the same amount every month. And it shouldn't be because profit differs every month. And so people have gotten used to the operator sending the exact same amount every month. And that's not how it's, you know, air quotes supposed to be. So when they stop distributions, people freak out. But what I try to share with them is, no, it, it's a good thing because if they are comfortable stopping distributions, that might prevent a capital call later because right, they're building up their reserves. So that's the first one. It's kind of everyone, we're talking each other off the ledge. It's okay if they pause distributions. It might even be good. And then the next big topic is, okay, now I'm getting a capital call. What do I do? Because a lot of people aren't participating. And if some do and some don't, that causes some issues. So how do you decide if you're going to participate in a capital call? I had uh, I've had a couple operators with capital calls, and the difference between the communication is incredible. 
The one was great. Said, hey, we're, you know, we've been talking to you for a long time about the possibility that's coming up. We are doing a capital call. Here's a three-page email outlining every single detail, why, what the problem is, what the solutions are, where this can go, what, what we're thinking, how much money we're going to put in, all of that. As opposed to someone who says, yeah, everything's fine, and then comes out and says, well, we have a couple of deals that are capital calls, but only a couple. And then two months later, oh, here's some more. And then a month later, here's a bunch, and some have already foreclosed, and we didn't tell you about it. Well, if you have both of those situations, you know, the first scenario, that operator is someone that I trust, right? I might invest with them again, even though they have a capital call, because the capital call was because of interest rates, not because they're high, but because of the pace that they rose. And that's, that's an issue, right? That's a problem. A lot of people got caught by that. But the other operator, it exposed operational failures. They hadn't done everything that they said they were going to do. And so you really have to be able to look at them and analyze them separately. And, and you know, the, the, the second company, I'll never invest with them again because they let us on. They weren't transparent. They didn't share information. You know, if you're going to give me bad information, give it to me straight and give it to me quickly. And, and that's what they, they didn't do. So I think that's really one of the struggles right now is how do you deal with capital calls and, you know, do you put more money? You don't want to throw good money in after bad, right? But you also don't want to just give up on a deal. So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation. You really have to re-underwrite the deal as if it's new coming to you right now. Would you invest again? And if the answer is yes, then maybe you participate in the capital call. If people do want to join the left field investors community, where can they go? What's the best place um, that they can do that? Uh, you can just go to leftfieldinvestors.com. There's a community button. You can subscribe. We just instituted a free trial. There's a, there's a free part uh, subscription and a paid, but the paid now you can get a seven day free trial and check it out and see if it's for you. And you know what I recommend really is I, I always say find a community. And you need to find a community where the culture of that community matches your personality. If left field investors isn't for you, then then go find a, a different one. But just find a community. Maybe find several. And, and that's really the way to go. So they can go to leftfieldinvestors.com or if they want to email me directly, my email address is jim at leftfieldinvestors.com. And we talk to investors all the time and would love to connect. Jim Pfeiffer, founder and CEO of Left Field Investors. Jim, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your story and your wisdom with us and our listener. Thanks for having me on. This was, this was fun. 